Sincerely yours, The Breakfast Club. It's like, who do you love? Ow, ow, no, no, sit, sit. Hello, and welcome back to John Hughes Revisited. This week, we're babysitting the kids and whipping up some ginormous pancakes as we hang out with the one and only Uncle Buck. Who are you? I'm your Uncle Buck. Released in 1989, the film was produced while Hughes was on a collaboration hot streak with John Candy. With it being the third movie the pair made together in the span of three years, preceded by Planes, Trains, and Automobiles and The Great Outdoors. Not to mention Candy's previous appearance in one of Hughes' earliest works, National Lampoon's Vacation. Uncle Buck centers on a slobbish bachelor who babysits his brother's teenage daughter along with her younger siblings while the parents are away dealing with a family emergency. His relationship with his girlfriend, Shanice Kobolowski, experiences some friction due to the fact that she wants a husband and a family, but Buck won't commit because he loves his carefree lifestyle too much. To his family and friends, Buck seems like the last person you would think of to watch the kids. Hey, I, I, I'm real sorry about those bushes, too. I had no idea that they would all catch on fire like that. You know, you were right. I should never have put the barbecue that close. However, by the end, Buck matures into a more responsible family man thanks to his time spent with his nieces and nephew. The film might be Hughes's most underrated directorial effort, and if you agree, you'll probably love our other content, too. So why not like this video and subscribe to our channel so you can be notified each time a new video goes live. Obviously, John Candy plays the eponymous character of Uncle Buck Russell. Believe it or not, Candy wasn't the first choice for the role. There were other high-profile actors up for the part, with the studio heavily considering Danny DeVito to star as the drinking, smoking uncle. Not that Danny wouldn't have made the part his own, but Candy nails every single scene he's in. I mean, in the wrong hands, lines like this. I would just like to hear the pitter-patter of tiny feet before I die. I'll get you a mouse and a piece of sheet metal. Could come off far meaner, but with Candy, it just comes off lovable. You really can't picture any other actor in the role. No. Hughes's fruitful working relationship with Candy on the set of Planes, Trains, and Automobiles is what really landed him the gig. His girlfriend, Shanice, is played by Amy Madigan. His brother, Bob, is played by Garrett M. Brown. You may recognize him as Dave's father in Matthew Vaughn's Kick-Ass. Rick Moranis was also another name that was considered for the role. Bob's wife, Cindy, is played by Elaine Brumka. Jean Louisa Kelly plays Tia, the eldest rebellious daughter. The role was actually her feature debut, and the process to find the right person for the part was long and arduous. I recommend that you stay out of my personal life. Before Kelly was cast, Hughes first sought after Winona Ryder after seeing her in Beetlejuice, but she was too busy shooting Heathers to accept the role. Even though most of the story's conflict stems from Buck's relationship with his moody niece, the two actors got along quite famously off camera. There was zero animosity between them, and Kelly shared that it was an honor and a privilege to work with Candy on this film. Aw, oh, that's sweet. Macaulay Culkin plays Miles, the middle child. This was the film that essentially got him the part of Kevin McAllister in Home Alone. After impressing John Hughes with his precociousness on set, the mailbox scene where Miles interrogates Shanice is how the idea for Home Alone was planted in Hughes' brain. Can we please take it out of there? Take it out! The youngest child, Maisie, is played by Gabby Hoffman. Funny enough, Amy Madigan, who plays Shanice, appeared with Hoffman as her mother in Feel the Dreams, which released the same year as Uncle Buck. Jay Underwood plays Tia's seedy boyfriend, aptly named Bug. What's his last name, Spray? <laughs> Lori Metcalf plays Marcy, the neighbor who lives across the street and attempts to have a fling with Buck. Even though the role is minor, Metcalf gets in some decent one-liners. Is there a big sexy guy in here? Suzanne Shepard shows up in a brief role as Anita Hogarth, the strict assistant principal of Maisie's school. Mike Starr plays Pooter the Clown, a birthday clown who Buck rejects for being drunk. <coughs> While he's hard to recognize here, take off the makeup and you may know the actor as Frenchie from Goodfellas or Mental from Dumb and Dumber. Wanna hear the most annoying sound in the world? 
If you have a keen eye, you can spot another familiar face in the film. During Maisie's scene in the school, the classmate sitting next to her is Anna Klumsky, who would go on to star in My Girl with Macaulay Culkin. Small World. This was the first film directed, written, and produced by Hughes under a multi-picture deal with Universal Studios. Principal photography commenced on January 4, 1989 in Chicago. The film was initially supposed to take place in St. Louis, but it was changed to the Windy City because unusually warm weather in Missouri that year forced the production to move to a more wintry climate. The production company decided to keep the film facilities and locations as close by as possible. Like the majority of John Hughes' productions, they filmed at the vacant New Trier High School in Illinois. Three of its gyms were converted into sound stages to house the sets, such as the two-leveled interior of the Russell House. The school was also equipped to suit the needs of the production crew, classrooms for the young actors, wardrobe department, editing bays, a special effects shop, equipment storage areas, and a projection booth. Buck's signature car is a 1977 Mercury Marquis Roam, which he affectionately calls the Beast. The filmmakers used a combination of a gunshot and a firecracker to create its backfiring noise. You be home. Uncle Buck's theme also might sound familiar as it's a beat from rapper Tone Lock's Wild Thing. Also, for that hilarious interrogation scene between Miles and Buck, Candy implemented a useful method to help the young actor fire off the lines. For Colkin's close-up, Candy stood behind the camera and held handwritten lines from the script, which Candy wrote out by hand himself above his head for Culkin to recite as quickly as possible. Are you my dad's brother? What's your record for consecutive questions asked? 38. I'm your dad's brother, all right. At one point, following a long day of filming, John Candy hit up a pub with the music supervisor and several locals. The next day, Hughes heard a radio interview where a caller beamed about his time meeting the actor the night prior. Hughes was not pleased, and when he confronted Candy, the actor claimed Buck was supposed to look disheveled in the upcoming scene, so he thought the excursion was okay. As a result, Hughes canceled the day of filming and ordered Candy to get some rest. The production was shot, wrapped, and released theatrically, as well as on home video, all in the very same year. Shit just moved faster back then. The film was released on August 16, 1989, and earned $8.8 .8 million during its opening weekend, placing number one at the box office. The film retained the top spot for three more weeks before being bumped down the second by Sea of Love, starring Al Pacino. Nuts! By the end of its theatrical run, Uncle Buck grossed $79.2 million worldwide against a $15 million budget. At the time of its release, the film was met with mixed reviews. Strangely, Roger Ebert gave the movie one and a half stars out of four, writing that Uncle Buck was unusually bitter and angry for a Hughes film. It's strange the way this movie generates creepy feelings that work against everything it's trying to do. By the end of the movie, I wasn't sure that I would want Uncle Buck uh, living in my suburb with me. Uh, were we watching the same movie, Raj? This is essentially John Candy's Mr. Mom. They even reused the same gag of drying the laundry in the microwave. Which actually works, we found out. <laughs> you can actually do it. Ebert and Siskel said it was like watching two different movies because of the relationship he has with the two young kids and then the one he has with Tia. I think they were too dismissive because all that means is that all the fun scenes involving the kids just made me love it as a kid. You should see that toast. I couldn't even get it through the door. And then the more mature themes just make me love it as an adult. You ever hear of a tuna? <laughs> you ever hear of a ritual killing? <laughs> Oddly enough, after its home release, the VHS and poster artwork were altered. So instead of the original image of Uncle Buck knocking on the door with the entire family on the other side locking him out, three of the older family members were removed completely from the image. The hope was that the film could be marketed as a kid's movie, and to also promote the two young popular child stars. I think that was kind of a weird move, since it is a family movie, and there's something for everyone, parents and kids included. The year after its initial release, CBS aired a television adaptation of the film starring Kevin Meaney as Buck. 
except the premise was much darker. Buck is named the legal guardian of the three kids after their parents perish in a car accident. Yeesh, good thing Roger Ebert didn't see that one. But hey, a similar concept worked for Full House. Dead parents were all the rage in the 90s. It was a stupid car accident, Grandma. The number came up. <laughs> the pilot actually caused a minor controversy in 1990 due to a scene where Maisie says, Mom, you suck! <laughs> the first time this had ever happened in an American network TV series. Blasphemer! Interestingly, no cast members carried over from the film, except for Dennis Cockrum, who plays Pal, the man hitting on Tia in the bowling alley scene. He's the only cast member to appear in the show, although he strangely plays a different character named Skank. No Skank. Hughes was emphatically unsupportive of the idea of turning any of his films into TV shows. He tried to talk Paramount out of the Ferris Bueller TV series, and subsequently refused to help Universal in any way with Uncle Buck. Taking care of three kids was the last thing I ever wanted to do. In fact, Hughes didn't even know the show existed until its producers asked to use exterior footage the director shot for the film. Let me get... you not... give me a... Oh. Both sitcoms premiered in 1990 and were dead within a year. The show was canned thanks in part to poor critical reception, and after CBS moved it to Friday night to establish their own TGIF lineup, but its ratings quickly plummeted and ended before the rest of the episodes could be aired. However, what's old is new again, and this time ABC gave the property another chance. In June 2016, a second TV series premiered starring Mike Epps in the title role and Nia Long as Buck's sister-in-law. And it too suffered a similar fate as the previous incarnation, with it being panned by critics and canceled only after eight episodes. Uncle Buck, there's a drawing of a naked lady in the bathroom. Yeah, there is. You need to study that, little man. I learned more in the toilet than I did in school. Oh, that's not all. In 1991, Uncle Buck was remade into an Indian film called Uncle Bun. It starred the prolific Indian actor Mohanlal as a younger version of the character named Charlie, who earns the nickname Uncle Bun for some reason after winning over the younger children. This iteration of the character still possesses a heart of gold and a love of music, along with a newfound fondness for pets, particularly rabbits. There's also a bizarre subplot involving his sister-in-law Sarah deeming Charlie responsible for the untimely death of her youngest sister, Rosie, who once used to be Charlie's love interest. And you thought your family was weird. And if you're interested, the entire movie is on YouTube. Before we wrap up, I just want to take a moment to discuss some slang I discovered in the process of researching this episode. Well, I'm Uncle Wart. Just old Buck Wart Russell, that's what they call me. Or uh, Melanoma Head, they'll call me that. Apparently, the term Uncle Bucked refers to the act of being in a photo at the time of the taking, only to find out that you have been cropped out. Oof. Another usage of this phrase is to use a drill to unlock a door. And the last notable meaning has to do with an urban legend surrounding a non-existent deleted scene where Uncle Buck takes a dump in the shower and has to squish it down the drain with his foot. Again, I must stress that there is no actual scene depicting this. I'm telling on that one. Honestly, I have a deep appreciation for this film. I'm not sure what old Roger Ebert was referring to, but to me, this movie is like a nice warm hug. Sure, there's a coarseness contained within. Your nails are digging to my arm, God damn it. Pick it up. But that just adds to the appeal for me and helps the film age well. Like a fine wine, it's only gotten better with time. Even after all these years, the punchlines still land, soundtrack still slaps, and the edits are still slick. Like the heartbeat sound effect match cut with the phone ringing to signify the inciting incident of the heart attack. tells the story very well and walks a fine line between vulgarity I'm gonna shove my load into you whether you like it or not come on <sighs> and family friendly hilarity this might be my favorite collaboration between Hughes and Candy even if Candy's performance in planes trains and automobiles is the flashier role similar to the ending of that film 
the final shot of Uncle Buck is a freeze frame of John Candy's face. Even though the man had a world-class charm and wit, his expressions could say a thousand words. Uncle Buck is a heartwarming look at someone realizing they have what it takes to be a good parent, and how family responsibility can bring out the best in us. It's a timeless story about family, personal growth, and being there for the ones you love. In the pantheon of John Hughes's films, it was his final great directorial effort. And on that note, I award Uncle Buck five out of five bowling balls. As always, thanks for watching.